بسم الله الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله My name is Akhil Ingram and in a previous lifetime I was a student in the Islamic University of Medina and I would like to afford you the experience that I had so that you can understand what it is like to seek knowledge and be able to do it for yourself. We're going to be talking today about my first day in the Islamic University of Medina. And if you would like to hear about how I got accepted in the Islamic University of Medina, well, then you can just refer back to that video where we discuss that. Now, when I arrive in the prophetic city of Al Medina, then I'm living with some friends off campus and we, we get to my first day, my first day of school. But when you first get there to the Islamic University of Medina, you don't start school first. There are a series of assessments that you must go through before you can actually start your courses. And from the first of things that happen is that you, you have to get your, your medical exams done. So a lot of the same testing that I had to do in the States before I traveled to Medina, we had to do a lot of these tests over again. I mean, they, they tested me for uh, my blood. I had to do x-rays and give a medical history and you know, my eyes and height and weight and just a lot of things that we had to do as an initial assessment. And you, you have to go to the, the building of, of acceptance and registration and, and kind of get yourself set up. And you, you have to uh, get your, your ID for school. You also have to give your your passport to them and they work on giving you an iqama which is like a residency card kind of similar to a green card here in the states and you're just getting yourself set up you're getting processed in to the university and after you do these initial processes then there is placement testing that is done and with the placement testing what happens is you're tested in your level of the of the Arabic language. And here is something that I'm gonna share with you so that you don't make the same mistake that I made. And we accept the, the Qadr of Allah, we accept the decree of Allah. Um, and along with this, I believe that this was an error and I would not like you to make the same error as I tell you the story. So what happens is that you're tested for your Arabic, you walk into a, a testing center, and you're, you're given a, a, a paper, at least at my time, it was paper, I'm sure it may be on computer now. But in any regard, you're, you're given a paper and you have to write out your test, right? And it's a lot of Arabic questions, testing the level of your, your fluency, your grammar, your vocabulary, things of this nature. And myself, before I went to the university, I had done some study of the Arabic language. Now, not at the level of proficiency that I am now, and not at the level of proficiency where I would be able to go straight into the kulia, the faculty of, of my choice, which for me ended up being sharia, ah, as I started on a hadith track and ended up on a sharia ah track, but it was enough to get me past the first initial levels of the Arabic program, okay? And in the Arabic program, as we discussed previously, it's a two-year Arabic program for college semesters. Uh, typically, there can be some adjustment to that, but typically. And you learn Arabic enough to be proficient on a collegiate level of Arabic where you can function and study Islamic sciences with Arabic-speaking people as their first language because we, we study these sciences in the Arabic language in the Islamic University of Medina. There's no English that's being exchanged. So you have to learn Arabic first if you don't know it. So we have in our country what we call the Medina books. We call the Medina book one, Medina book two, Medina book three. And these works have been authored by Dr. Fa Adurahim. May Allah bestow expansive mercy upon his soul as he's recently passed away. But this isn't all of the Arabic program, right? But in the States, before I went to this university and before I take this test, I had studied Medina Book One several times over. 
with different teachers. I had studied Medina Book Two, and I had some familiarity with, with the Arabic language. So when it was time for me to take the test, here's the error that I made that I don't want you to make. I just simply put my name on the test at the top and handed it back to the instructor and walked out of the testing room. Why would I do that? Well, in seeking advice from the students who had preceded me, the mindset of many of the Western students at that time was that we want to stay in Medina as long as possible. We want to prolong it as long as we can to get as much out of the experience as we can. Now, the idea was that I would start in the first level of the ABIC program and then matriculate my way through, through the ABIC program and then into the, the faculty of my choice. As I told you, for me, ended up being Sharia and then onward from there. But I knew that if I had actually done that test, that I would have been placed, I definitely would have tested out of level one for sure. And potentially I would have tested out of level two of the ABRIC program, which means I would have been placed in either level two or level three of the ABRIC program, which now means instead of having uh, two years in the ABRIC program, I may have one year, a little bit more than one year, and that may have decreased the entire time that I was able to stay in Medina to benefit less. That was the mindset. But in hindsight, I believe that was an error. So any of you that have this opportunity and you do have a level of study, I would advise you to uh, enter in at the level where you are and don't enter into the university at a lower level than you are because of the fact that it's not only time-based, but there's also a matter of, of baraka. There's also a matter of blessing. There is also a level of fulfillment and achievement. And this is what I mean by this. So had I tested in at the level that I actually was, then I would have been able to benefit on a higher level of knowledge. And because I'm benefiting on a high level of knowledge, I will be able to receive more and receive it more quickly than what I thought was giving myself more time to do things. And this is what I would advise all of you. Because as a Sa'di, rahimahullah ta'ala, may love us so expansive mercy upon a soul, has advised the students of knowledge that you take the shortest path to scholarship. You don't necessarily take the longest path. You want to take the shortest path that allows you to achieve your goal. Because once you have reached a, a certain level, then again, as we're saying, you can benefit a lot more. You can learn a lot more. You can perceive a lot more. You have much better context and you're able to make much, much better use of the time that you have. So this is what happened. So we, we, do the, we do the test, we give it back, and then eventually you receive your schedule and then you go to class, okay? So my first day, my first day, um, I remember my first teacher being a Sheikh Nasir Al-Umri. Uh, may Allah preserve him. He was my, my first teacher in the Arab program. And, and the way that it was set up, my first semester, we had five classes. We had five classes. And we stayed inside the classroom, and the teachers would come to us, right, in the classroom that, that we were. So you have an assigned classroom, and it's the teachers that are rotating and not the students that are rotating classrooms. So we had uh, Tedri Bat, what we call Tedri Bat, okay? This was what Sheikh Nasir al-Umri taught us. Tedri Bat is what we commonly call in the West Medina Book One. That's not his actual name, right? The subject is called Tedri Bat. And the focus here is on grammar and vocabulary. So that's that subject. We had another subject called Ta'bir. And Ta'bir, this is Arabic expressions, articulation. This is helping you with your ability to speak the Arabic language. 
We then had another subject called al qiraa which is reading and comprehension. We had another subject called Kitaba, which is penmanship. And of course, we have uh, Quran. We have Quran as a study as well. Now, what happens is in the West, we have these three books that we call the Medina books, right? Medina book one, Medina book two, and Medina book three. And then we think in the West, that's all that we're studying in the Arabic program in the Islamic University of, of Medina. That's not true. What we call the Arabic program during my day, it was called the Shu'ba, right? The Shu'ba of the Arabic language, right? The branch of the Arabic language. It was later changed um, uh, a little bit later on, actually during the time that I was there, it was changed to the Maha, the Institute of the, of the Arabic language. Now, here's what actually happens. It's not just your first semester, you're only studying what we call Medina Book 1 here in the, in the West, but as I'm explaining to you, what we call Medina Book 1 is only one of five subjects and five books that we study at that level. When you get to level two of the Arabic program, your second semester, you're, we had 10 subjects, not just Medina Book 2. We had 10 subjects that we studied. When you get to the third level of the Arabic program, you don't just have Medina Book 3 in your third semester. We had, uh, I want to say that we had 13 subjects, yes. We had 13 subjects that semester, not just Medina Book 3. Or the first half of Medina Book 3, because that's what studied at the, in the third semester, or the third level of the Arabic program. And then in the fourth level of the Arabic program, in your fourth semester, then uh, I recall having 10 subjects not just the second half of Medina Book 3. So there are a myriad of subjects that we study. So by the time you go through the entire program, you have studied 40 books. That's four zero. You studied four books with concentration on the Arabic language, not just the three books we have here in the West. There are 40, right? And you're studying many different, many different subjects. Of course, the concentration is the Arabic language. However, we, we do study, uh, for example, some fiqh, some hadith, sirah. So we study some law, some prophetic tradition. We study the biography of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and other fields as well, stories of the prophets. There are numerous fields that we have that, that we study. Now, what happens is, what, what happens is, these particular books that we study they're all in Arabic. We're learning Arabic in Arabic. So back to my, my, my first semester, my first day. There's no English. And there can't be any English because in my classroom, my first semester, I was the only American in my class. I recall there being uh, three gentlemen from China that were in my class. One of them, his name was Uthman. Uh, may Allah preserve him. And I remember his recitation of the Quran was such a such a beautiful recitation. He would uh, recite the Quran. He would sound exactly like a Sheikh of the Rahman of Sudais. May Allah preserve the Sheikh. Amazing. We didn't even know any, we didn't even know any Arabic yet, right? And he he speaks his Chinese. But when he recites the Quran, he sounds just like Sudais. A beautiful, beautiful recitation. And I'm sure he's from the Hufad of the Qur'an and the reciters at this point in time, uh, these years later. There were two people from France that were in my class. We, we had um, people from West Africa that were in my class. I remember there, there being a gentleman from Afghanistan who was in my class. So people from all, from all around the world. So even if the professor spoke in English, it really only would have benefited me. What about the other 30 students that are in my particular class, right? So the only true medium of language is the Arabic language. That's the only central language for us. So then you might be asking, well, then how do you learn Arabic if you don't know, if you don't know Arabic and you're speaking in Arabic and they're speaking to you in Arabic? How do you do it? Well, honestly, it's similar to the way that uh, a baby learns. When, when a baby is born, does a baby know language? Does a baby know grammar? Does a baby know how to speak? But just through immersion, the, the child eventually figures out language and becomes proficient in that particular language. Likewise, 
in this ivory program. This is how it is done. It's an immersion program. Now, at each level of the program, they are professionals, they are experts. So even though you're learning Arabic, they know how to interact with you on your level of Arabic. In every level that you go up, the expectation is higher and the level of interaction is, is also higher. So, for example, the teacher might say, Hava tufahun. This is an apple, right? And the teacher may hold up a picture of an apple. So even though he's not saying this is an apple, you're saying, okay, well, I see the picture there. That's an apple. And he's saying the word tufah. So the word tufah must have something to do with, with an apple, right? And as such, you gradually, you gradually, you gradually get it. So this is how that is done. And what, what happens is you, you matriculate through. There's testing, right? There, there's testing that occurs at the end of, of the semester. And if you go through the testing and, and you pass your, your examinations at the end, then you, you're able to go to the, to the next level. However, you have to pass all of your classes that you're given at that level in that semester. If you fail one, you have to do the entire program uh, or excuse me, the entire semester or the entire level over again. So for example, that first semester, we had five subjects. So then I had to pass all five subjects. If I failed any one of them, then I had to go back and repeat. And the way that it was uh, during the time that I was there, you really only got two shots at that at a level where you are. And meaning to say, that let's say I did not, but let's say that I, I failed that first semester. If I failed that first semester, I get to do or any one class. I could have passed four and failed one. And if I fail that semester, any class, I have to do the first semester over again. If I fail anything else a second time, then I'm out of the university. I'm, I'm done. Okay. So there's a little bit of, of, of sink or swim that is that's there with that. So um, now there are there are some exceptions that they did make with this. I remember there was a gentleman from from Venezuela, one of the two students there. He had a, such a, a beautiful, uh, bright character, and I think in all of the country of Venezuela, there were only three students from that particular country. And this one particular brother, he just had such a tough time working through the Arabic language and Arabic program, things like this. They gave him a whole lot of chances. They gave him a lot more chances than what was the standard. And I believe he eventually did uh, work his way through. So this is this is how that works. Now, to give you an idea of of what we are are studying on the Quran side of things in, in the Arabic program, and I'll even give you some of the university study as well when you get into your faculty of choice. Well, what, what happens is that we are giving we are given the last eight juz of the Quran in the Arab program, right? They give us a book with the last eight juz of the Quran from the chapter Yasin, the 36th chapter of the Quran, all the way through a uh, Surah Tanas. Now, throughout that period of time, we're only required to memorize juz amma, the last 30th of the Quran, the last para of the Quran. You know, like, alun. what is it that they're all asking about, right? And juz amma, para amma, or the last 30th of the Quran is called juz amma because this part of the Quran, the first verse in the chapter that starts this part of the Quran, which is the, the which is Surah al Naba, the first words of it are, Amma yitasa alun. You hear it? Amma. So because the first word is amma, it's called juz amma as such. So throughout our time that we have to memorize this particular juz of the Quran throughout those four semesters, but then in our reading of, of the Quran, we are reading the last five adza or the last five juzes, paras of the Quran. Now, if you're doing well, then you go above and beyond of just what is required of you. And you're not only memorizing just Amma, and perhaps like uh, like many of us, by the time you got to the university, you may have already memorized just Amma anyway. So 
you can work on not just reading those five jewels, but memorizing those five jewels, right? And as some of us, as I was told before I got there, one of the first things that you do is you get a Quran teacher. And, and that's what I did as well. So outside of just what the university required, when I first got to the university, then after the Asa prayer near the neighborhood where I lived, I lived in a neighborhood called Hayyim Nasab. The neighborhood across from where I lived at was called Ardo del Kurdi. And there was a masjid there who had a sheikh, Sheikh Khalid. He was an Egyptian and he was a teacher of the Quran and he would teach the Quran to children. But he will allow us as students of the university to come in and, and learn Quran from, his, from him as well. So I would sit and I would learn Quran from him after Asr outside of university time. So from the standpoint of the Quran, if you're, if you're going above and beyond just simply what is required of you, then by the time you have finished the Arabic program, then you would have uh, completed minimally uh, Juz Amma and the remaining five Juz or the last five Juz of the Quran. And what happens after you matriculate through the Arabic program, and we'll save this uh, for another episode, inshallah ta'ala, to speak about the colleges and such, the kulliyat, as they're called, the faculties. So as you matriculate through, when you get into the fourth level of the program, then you select which faculty you would like to go to. You select your faculty. And in the Islamic University of Medina, there are five faculties. We have, in no particular order, you have the faculty of the Qur'an, you have the faculty of, of Hadith, you have the faculty of Sharia, which is Fiqh and Usul of Fiqh, which is judicial law and jurisprudence, legal stuff. And you have the faculty of Usul al-Din wa da'wa. You have the faculty of Islamic disciplines or a da'wa wa Usul al-Din, Usul al-Din wa da'wa. You have a, a Islamic disciplines and inviting to Allah, right? Propagation of the faith. And then you have the faculty of the Arabic language. These are the five faculties that are there. And the way that these faculties are set up, there is a base curriculum that exists in all five faculties. So there's a base education that all students of the Islamic University of Medina receive. However, based on the faculty that you go to, you're going to receive a deeper dive in a deeper level of expertise in the field that you have chosen. So yes, all faculty study the Quran, but if you go to the faculty of Quran, you're going to get much deeper into the qira'at, the modes of recitation of the Quran, the memorization of the Quran, the tafsir of the Quran, exegesis of the Quran, ulum al Quran, the hermeneutics or the sciences of the Quran, for example. And as such, in hadith, you're going to go much further into the field of hadith, whilst we all, while all colleges have a general study of hadith, in the faculty of hadith, you're going to go much deeper into the field, into mustalih al-hadith, into the, the terminology of the hadith or the philology of hadith. You're going to get into the compilation of the sunnah in depth. You're going to get into uh, how do you grade a hadith. You're going to get into the, main, the men that are in the chains of the narrations. How do you research and reference a particular hadith. You're going to get into all those uh, all those particulars, the minutiae of that in the faculty of Sharia, ah, in, in the faculty of, of fiqh and usul of fiqh, judicial law and jurisprudence. Yes, there's going to be a base curriculum that is that you're going to study. You're going to do Quran. You're going to do hadith. You're going to do Arabic language. You're going to do aqidah, but you're going to do a much deeper dive, for example, on fiqh, on law. For example, in the Islamic University of Medina, in the faculty of Sharia, and I can speak to this because it's the faculty of, of choice for me, that you, you study a base of the Hanbali Madhab. The base is the Hanbali Madhab, a work entitled Rod al murbir but of Al-Bahuti. But you lay on top of that Bidayatul Mushtahid, which is a work in comparative fiqh. So we have concentration in the Hanbali Madhab but then we also study comparative fiqh as well so that we are familiar with the other madahib as well. For example, we do a deep dive on usul fiqh, on legal theory. And we, we study the, the work that is entitled Rodo to Nadir in usul fiqh, in, in legal theory. We, we study judgeship, for example. We study logic and debate. 
We study court claims. We study a uh, public policy. We study a lot of different things that have to do with law as an expertise. But because it's Sharia, because it's our legislation, in order to properly study fiqh, in order to properly study law, you need knowledge of the Quran. So there's memorization of the Quran that we do, and there's also tafsir of the Quran that we do. Albeit our study of tafsir is focused on the, the verses that speak to the laws of Islam, but we have to study tafsir, for example. You can't do fiqh if you don't have knowledge of hadith. So we have a study of hadith. Uh, albeit our focus is on hadith law, the work Bulugh al-Maram, for example, in hadith law, but we have to study some hadith. We have to study hadith literature, the compilation of the sunnah. We study the, the Arabic language, right? We, we study al fiya ibn Malik, for example, and, and thus and so. And we don't want to go too far into that. We can, in a separate segment, speak to the different faculties and, and what they concentrate on. But the point that I really wanted to get to as we come closer to a close for today is that in the in the kulliyat, uh, once you make your selection, right? Once you make your selection, you 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 then go to this particular faculty, and then throughout the four years that you're there, there's a focus on from al fatiha, from al fatiha all the way up to sort of the toba, right? All the way up to sort of the toba. Okay, so you you're doing about eight plus adza of the Quran. Eight plus juzes or paras of the Quran. So if you go through this, if you go through the entire of the system of the Islamic University of Medina and what the university requires of you and what you're able to capitalize on from what they provide, then there should not be a, a student of the Islamic University of Medina who completes the entire program except that you're graduating with half of the Quran memorized. And if you're doing well and you're not limiting yourself only to what the university provides and you're studying the Quran outside of university time, well, then you have an opportunity to complete the entire of the Quran throughout the time that you are in the Islamic University of Medina. But we just wanted to take a moment to speak to you about the first day in the Islamic University of Medina and, and what you can expect if you were to have this experience or if you apply and if you go there one day, kind of how it's all set up and also to help you in your decision making process so that you know what it's kind of like and if this is for you or it's not for you. Because I did not have this level of depth of understanding of what I was getting into before I went. I was I tried to get there for two years when I was 16 and I got there when I was 18 and had no idea what I was really walking into when I got there. So if you like this type of a content, uh, let me know, comment, let me know you like it, and perhaps we'll do more of it. Barakallahu feekum. See you next time. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wait, don't go anywhere yet. I appreciate you getting to the end of the video. I have a question for you. Do you have a desire in you to become a student of knowledge? Have you wanted to travel overseas or even get into an Islamic university? Maybe even the Islamic University of Medina, but things didn't pan out for you. Maybe you wanted to learn the Arabic language, you learned some or, or, or none at all, and you just don't have the access that you need to get to the path of knowledge. Well, I have a gift for you. We have put together a program for you where we give you the experience that we had in the Islamic University of Medina, the actual courses in the Islamic University of Medina, remove all the barriers and just give you the experience. You don't have to know Arabic, you don't have to travel overseas, you don't have to get accepted in university. We are calling it the Medina Student Boot Camp. We give you that and so much more. If this sounds like you, click the link below. See you on the other side.